morning, everybody. Everybody doing all right? Worship was fire. Thank you, Chad and the team. Thank you, Rocky. Man, what a great time. Come on, y'all. Come on. Say thank you. Say thank you. Man, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans um, 16. Uh, we're going to be journeying. What a great, what a great passage to, um, to study this morning. I'm going to tell you, get ready. Uh, it's not what you think. And so before I get into the text, I want us to, I want us to, um, I want to say thank you on behalf of the staff. Uh, man, just you, as a church, you guys have loved on us this whole pastor appreciation month. It's been really great. The personnel team uh, doing a, um, they did an ice cream bar. I'm telling you what, man, that, hey, we got to get on, we got to go to the gym after this. It's, it was, it's been bad. Uh, deacons brought barbecue, uh, man, it, it's just been off the charts. And so again, I want to say thank you. What a great loving church. So thank you guys for being loving on the staff. I'm saying thank you on behalf of the whole team. Uh, so today is going to be a little bit interesting. Today is going to be interesting. Um, so just get ready. And, uh, before we get started, I, I just want to, I want to say this. Sometimes when you, you read the Bible, you can read certain passages and then they just come off as just kind of a flippant passage or even just, you know, I'm going to gloss over this and, and not really um, give much attention to it. And so I thought, hey, would it be, this would be a great activity to start off with is kind of an object lesson. I have some pictures that will pop up here in just a little bit. Hey, man. All right, so what do you see? Anybody, let me ask you this question. Anybody see the young lady turning her head? Anybody? Okay, nice and high. Come on, y'all be bold with that thing. Okay. All right, anybody see the old lady? Okay, all right, all right. So some, it's, it's amazing how the, the brain works, right? Some people see a certain thing, some people see other things. Let's go to the next picture. Okay, so how many of you guys see a dog eating a bone? Everybody. How many of you guys see an old man? Yep, see, somebody's smart. Flip the picture upside down if you can. Y'all see that? You see the hat? You see the nose and the eyes, the eyebrows? Ooh, that's cold. Some of y'all like y'all. Some of y'all like pastor. Send me the picture. Y'all gonna need to look at this over lunch. Observation, careful analysis. Let's go to the next one. Okay, how many animals do you see in this picture? Five. Be careful before you throw a number out there. Okay, let's start with Captain Obvious. Anybody see an elephant? No? Come on, man. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go there. Don't, don't mess up the sermon, whoever that was. All right, so elephant, how many of y'all see a donkey? All right, how many of y'all see a dog? How many of y'all see a cat? The cat really don't count, but y'all see the cat? All right, so how many of y'all see a mouse? How many of y'all see a fish? Ooh, nice. How many of y'all see a... Uh, let's see, a whale or, or um, a dolphin. How many of y'all see a snake? How many of y'all see a turtle? Dang, y'all did good. Y'all went to, man, it must have been Conroe ISD up in here. Hey, man. I went to Oakland. Oh, hey, I, the first hour, I was naming off stuff, and I didn't even, they were naming stuff all. Like, I don't even see that. Hey, man, I, I didn't mess up my whole little deal. I was learning with y'all. So here's the point I want to make. This is, this is our text today. Our text demands theological attention. It demands for us to actually analyze it in such a way to where we, we don't gloss over it, but we, we carefully observe what the text is actually saying. Again, mind you, as a teaching team, we never want to look at the sermon or look at the text and try to just make a sermon. So what, we do, what we do, all eight of us, we get in the room, we pray, and we study, and we, we look at the text and allow the text to come to us, or the sermon to come to us. And so, this morning, it's no different. And when we read Romans 16, 1 through 16, it's going to seem as if Paul has just had a memory lapse, or he's just had a number count, a word count, he had to hear him get the last little bit of words out, right? Like the Spirit gave him a word count, like you're doing a paper or something, uh, or he just, you know, uh, let, me just, uh, let me just throw some people in here. But it was way more than that. So um, I told you last week, as we read these names, okay, y'all stay with me. It's going to be some, it's going to get choppy. I don't know if y'all been on the airplane to get some turbulence. It's going to get turbulent up in here fast, all right? So here it is, Romans chapter 16 and verse 1. Careful observation. 
I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church, a century, century, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Verse 3, greet Prisca, some would argue this, um, the same from the Acts, but Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches, notice that, not a few churches, but all the churches. So y'all circle all in your Bibles, all the churches. Of the Gentiles, and they give thanks as well. Verse 5, greet also the church in their house. Oh, they were having house churches. They, they, just, they had to meet. They were meeting. We got a fellowship. We had a great fellowship Friday night. It was great. And some great food. Man, it was banging. Greet also the church in their homes. Greet my beloved. How many of y'all can say that one? Anybody got that one? Come on, if you bold with it, say it out loud. Come on. Papanitas, right? I said it quick. Sound like um, pe- um uh, let's see, uh, empanadas. Yeah, that's what it sound like. There you go, says. Thank you, <laughs> empanadas. Thank you. Who was the first? Notice this. Empanadas was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Let's keep reading. Greet Mary. That's an easy one. Common name during that time. Greet Mary, who was or who has, excuse me, worked hard for you. Now, if you're looking for names for your kids, just thank me later, amen, because this is a great list to choose from. Look at verse 7. Greet Andronicus. Looks like Android, doesn't it? I think that's where they got Android from. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known by the apostles. Interesting. And they were in Christ before me. Interesting. Greet, somebody say that one. Implitus, why not? My beloved in the Lord, greet Eubanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And my beloved, Stachy, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. I'm butchering these names, but the Lord, there's crazy forgiveness in the house. Amen. Greet those who belong to the family of Era to Bulusis, right? Is that right? <laughs> Who is it? Who's that? Aristopolis. Amen. Oakland Unified School District. Here we come with it. <laughs> Full disclosure is out here now, right? Here it is. All right. Greet my kinsman Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Look at that name. Anybody want to name your son Narcissus? <laughs> it's there in the Bible. It really means, in Greek, it means this. Y'all ready? Self boy. That's what it means. I thought I thought it out there for y'all. Verse 12, greet those workers in the Lord. Trephonia, Trephonia, or whatever. Amen. Real people. And Trephos, Trephosa. That, that's how I'm, I'm sounding like I'm from Africa somewhere now. I'm like, I am Mustafa, right? There it is. Greet the beloved Persis. Now she's a woman because she likes Persis. I'm going to say that later. Who has worked hard in the Lord? Greet Rufus, verse 13, chosen in the Lord, also his mother. Here's the cold part. Her, she didn't even get her name mentioned. Just, just as, as moms. That's moms. Who has been a mother. Look at the tenderness of Paul, though, here. Rufus's mom, he says, who has been a mother to me as well. Mm. How about this one? Greet who? A sent to Chris. That's what I'm going to say. Philegon, now I listen to all these and pronunciations, and I, by the time I listen, did it all the study, and I said, by the time I get in the pulpit, I'm not going to know these names. Hermes, Patrobas, if you know these and I'm butchering them, y'all just forgive me, amen, charge it to my head, not my heart. Hermas and the brothers who are with them, greet, what's that one? Philologus, all right, we're all learning together. Look at this one. What's this one? I figured y'all would know that one. Dr- Greet Julia, Nerysus, and his sister. Oh, and what's that one? Olympus. Olympus. And all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. 
Single brothers, this does not mean lean in right now. You're not getting a holy kiss. <laughs> greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now, I want to say this. The easiest part about this entire chunk of scripture is verse 16. That literally, the easiest part about this text is verse 16. In that, he says, greet one another with a holy, with a holy kiss. Traditionally, in that context, what they would do is mwah, mwah, on one side, on the other side. That was a way of salutation, saying hi and greeting, um, seeing somebody, considering somebody, and welcoming people in. It's kind of our day. You do this, right? Uh, 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 boom, boom. Everybody got signs. You ever seen basketball players? I mean, they got all these different signs and stuff. They be doing all this stuff here, right? Boom, boom, boom. You know, that's what it was. But this text argues something different. These are real people, by the way. Real people who had real names, hard to pronounce, real people with real names. They had real stories. They had real families. They had real dreams. They had real goals. They had real hurts. They had real joys. Some have kids. Maybe some didn't have kids. These are real people. And the danger of getting to the back end of a book or even like genealogies is just to gloss over this list very flippantly and just to chalk it up. But I, I demand you, and I actually not demand you, the, the text demand us, it demands our theological attention. It demands that we do theological work. The Lord is not going to reveal theological truth to lazy people. We have to put in some work. So looking at a list of names, the writer is going to say a couple things. But before we get going, let me do this. Let me just make a couple observations. This list consists of 26 names. Nine or plus or so are, are women names. Diverse groups of people, ethnically, socioeconomic, uh, statuses, Jews, Gentiles, people from Asia, different places, former slaves, estate leaders, low class, high, high class, male, female, married, single, households, individuals. This, this list highlights all those people. It's funny because as you read it, it kind of sounds like, it sounds like kind of the church, right? Diversity. But this text also has, and it comes with a complex, it's a complex list. Now, y'all stay with me on this. It's a very complex, there's complexities to the list. Out of the gate, you see this, he mentions Phoebe. Everybody say Phoebe. He mentions Phoebe's name, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that Paul spends most of his time in this, this little chunk that we read today talking about Phoebe. I think this is very intriguing. Again, this is, we can't be theologically lazy. We can't just go, oh, it's just a list of people. We have to really look at this in its context. Paul didn't have a memory lapse. He wasn't just saying some random things at the end. He says in verse 1, I commend to you our sister. It's almost like at a wedding when you say, I pronounce to you for the very first time, Mr. and Mrs. whatever it may be. I commend to you our sister, Phoebe. Notice what he says next. He says, a servant. Now, this word servant is the same word we get in Acts. We get doulos, which means deacon, one who hastes or can't wait to serve a table. He says, I commend to you, Phoebe. She's a servant of the church. But he didn't just say general church. Paul literally links her to a local church. Now, this, this text is going to argue some things. It's going to stretch us theologically. Some of y'all, I know, I told my wife, the first hour, it was tight. Uh, and that's okay. I'm going to keep on preaching. I'm going to keep mentioning that. You can feel the spirit when he's moving and how he's going to uh, uh, press it upon your hearts. And I'm going to say this. This may challenge you where you land theologically when it comes to women serving in the local church. This, this text argues this. I didn't make this up. The Apostle Paul wrote this list governed by the Spirit of God. I don't have editorial rights, neither do you. I don't have the right to just determine what I think the text says and, and not what the original author intended it for, to say. So here it is. He says, I commend to you. Hey, hey, I pronounce to you, Phoebe. 
a servant, doulos, uh, an under roar, um, a bond servant, uh, uh, just a person who, who can't wait to serve a table at century. Notice this. He goes to verse 2, that you may welcome her. Welcome her. Paul is saying, look, I'm going to tell you something. Hey, she's, I'm gonna, I, I trust in her. There's, there's value there. I'm commanding you as an apostle who wrote over half of the New Testament, when she shows up at your doorstep, you better welcome her. Don't you diss her. Don't you, don't you say what society is saying. Don't you say what everybody else is saying. Paul is literally saying, you welcome her. It's the same word as in a sense of greet with a holy kiss. You welcome her. You draw her in. Receive her like she was your own. He says this, that you may welcome her in the Lord. There it is. That's the premise. A way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Why is this important? Well, a couple things. I got to unpack this. But it's important because, again, we can't be lazy in, in our exegesis and our hermeneutical uh, approach. We have to really answer some questions here. The complexity of this list, I mentioned a little while ago, there's 26 names and nine plus of them are women. Paul spends most of his time in this text specifically this morning Talking more about Phoebe, Phoebe in verse 1, Aquila in verse 3, Mary in verse 6, Janai in verse 7, which is very intriguing as well, Trifonia or whatever in Trifos in 12, Persis in 12, Rufus's mother in 13, Julia in 15. This text literally argues something. It refutes the notion and the claim that Paul was against women. Y'all see this? Why would Paul spend all of this time writing these names of these ladies, a third of the list. A third of the list. Now, mind you, I know in the church, tradition has, has become the engine. Tradition has become the engine in that we have allowed tradition. Tradition is not bad. All of us have traditions. Tradition can be very good. But when traditions trump theological truth, we have an issue. When tradition, we don't, when we're lazy theologically, coming to the text, and we just, we just been spoon-fed tradition based on what we've been taught, what we've been um, around, or what we've been fed, and we no longer look at the text and wrestle with the text ourselves, that is hermeneutical malpractice. So therefore, the Spirit is saying something else. I really believe that, that ladies, you have a place in the church. As a matter of fact, we wouldn't have a church without Women. I like to a couple people clapping. Hey, man. The tension, here's the tension. Here's the tension. Traditionally, it's been like, hey, well, ladies, just uh, shh, quiet. You can greet at a door. You can hold a baby. You can sing on the stage. Um, I, never, I haven't seen a lady at parking, but you can definitely do parking ministry if you want to. Hey, man. Serving students. I mean, it's just, it's just choir. I mean, we can, we can listen. But, you know, when it comes to, like, being a deaconess, uh-oh. No. The text is actually telling us something different, church. Here's why I land here, and here's why I believe Paul put her in here. He, he, tie, he connects her to the local church, the church she was serving at. She was known by the people at this particular church, at Centre. She was known by them. That they, she served them. She, she, she went to their homes and, and probably blessed them with a hot meal, if you will. She served the local church, and Paul knew that, and Paul had heard about it. I commend you, therefore. I pronounce to you, O oh, Phoebe. Now, let me just say this. As a church, we hold that the office of a senior pastor or a pastor is for men. I know there's great debate out there for that. Let me just say that. Let me just, let me just say that. Just in essence, how God has wired uh, his, his structure, even in creation, male, female, there are some dynamics. That's a whole other sermon, but there's some dynamics there that helps us understand this. But it doesn't say this because God's order is the way he's planned it or laid it out, that inside the church, some things, women can just sit and be quiet and just say amen. God has given women the Holy Spirit just like brothers. My wife is smarter than me. I'm going to tell you right, Mandy is smarter than me. 
She's more gifted than me. She's a better writer than me. She's a better teacher than me. I did say that. And I'm, just hear me say this. I know you're like, oh, where are we going? Oh, he about to drop a nugget on us. Oh, man. No, 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 guys. I'm, I'm tight theologically and conservatively. I am. I want to hold tight to this. I want to hold tight to sound doctrine by God's grace. But let me just say this. If I'm not careful, I'm not surrendering to the spirit of God or our leadership, we can make this text say whatever we want it to say. But because we know that the scripture demands from us that we do proper hermeneutics and we wrestle with the text in its original context and the original language and we say these are real people and Paul just didn't, uh, he'd have a memory lapse and go, hey, I'm just going to add a random group of people here. No, they are placed here for a reason. So that reason is this. I know you're like, man, you're really harping on that. Here's the deal. We believe at Crossroads, again, that the office of a pastor, senior pastor and pastor is for a man and I think we've got it, we've, we've kind of begun in the church, not here in this church, but across the board, across the, the country, we've, we've, we've dissected, or the issue is, well, is it, is it minister or is it pastor? Here's what I mean. We have made value determined, determined by the office or role we hold in the church. We've, we just like, hey, if you have this, you have value. Well, hold on. And that was never the determination of the role of the pastor and the role, uh, and the role never determines necessarily value in that sense. The pastor's role is to shepherd and to care for the flock, not one of power or influence solely. So regardless of role, we are called to serve and to minister to one another using our gifts as, of, as our value is not determined in what our, our title or things of that nature, our value, your value, ladies, it comes from, it's not necessarily in the role either. It is actually in the one, your value comes from the one who created you. I want to wrestle and take my time with this text. Phoebe, Phoebe, here it is, Diakonos, Acts chapter 6. Uh, she, she, she really did some, some, some laboring. And I would even say this, true theologically and historically, Paul would give after he wrote all of Romans. Guys, this thing we've walked through since January. Paul finishes the manuscript. He hands it to Phoebe. I don't know if that, that just strikes different with you. It just strikes different with me. Paul said, man, I can trust her. There's character here. There's, there's integrity here. I mean, she's a leader. And in my own mind, here's, here, hear me say this. Some of y'all are like, oh, Lord. I, I wonder when she, she delivered it to the church in Rome. That's just my own speculation. If one of the guys, because they would read this stuff out loud, I wonder if somebody was like, hey, well, hey, uh, Phoebe, uh, what did Paul mean by, uh, um, uh, what did Paul mean by we're justified by, by faith? Did she go, well, this is not my space to talk. I just, I'm just asking a question. I think she probably shared what the letter meant. And you'll see on the back end why I would argue that. So Phoebe, not just Phoebe, yet Janiah. The NIV reads in verse 7, it reads that she was well known or and Janiah, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, they were known among, that's what the NIV would say, known among the apostles. Our ESV says they were well known to the apostles. And they, notice this, and they were in Christ before me. That's a, that's a humbling statement for Paul to say. Again, he wrote over half of the New Testament. Why would you add that little clause on there? And by the way, and they were in Christ before me. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying they've been doing, this couple, they've been doing work way before I hit the scene. They, they have been risking their lives. And, and somehow, some way, they found themselves in the same cell or in the same confines as Paul at some point in time. And Paul calls them fellow prisoners. But they, they had to have been known not just by Paul, but also by the apostles. Before Paul had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, these people, Janai and them, were already doing tremendous work for the kingdom of God. And Paul wants to take record and help us to understand that, that they had been doing long work before I even knew the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now there's debate again, is she considered a apostle? There's much room for debate there. Or was she just known by the apostles for having a significant impact in the advancement of the church? I'll let you put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. But you think about the ladies in a minute. Think about this. Think about this. Think about this. Think about all the ladies that followed Jesus' ministry. Now, no, no. Think, read your Bible. There were a lot of ladies. As a matter of fact, there were ladies first to the tomb. That's a cold, that's cold right there. Where the brothers at? We weren't even at the tomb. Now, they were going to the tomb in a certain way, despondent, which naturally all of us would have been. But they were going to the tomb nonetheless. And so, but not only that, they would leave the tomb and proclaim that the Christ is risen. When we think of evangelists, we think of Billy Graham. We think of, man, strong personalities, John, Jonathan Edwards and Moody and you know, all these greats through the years. Even Greg Laurie in our day-to-day, -day, Clayton King. And we think of all these great pontificators. I mean, do you know in John chapter 4 that the woman at the well was the first evangelist? She had an encounter with Jesus. And what stopped her? Jesus, she dropped the bucket. She found comfort in and identity in. She dropped that. She goes into the town and begins to share freely about what happened in her life. We tend to, again, tradition. Be careful with tradition. Tradition will hold, tradition will hold you back. Tradition can blind you. Tradition can steal from you what the Bible desires to teach you. Be very careful. And so... The Great Commission, have you thought about this? It's funny because the Great Commission, we, tradition says that, you know, so here we've encouraged our deacon wives to actually help serve communion. That was something that happened after a year and some change of me being here and everybody was like, okay, we're good for it. The deacon team was like, yeah, we're good for it. Everybody was agreeing. Say, hey, amen, good. All right, so make sure you're with me on this because we roll this out. I want to be stoned to death. Hey, amen, come on now, All right? Be dodging rocks and carrying on. We ain't got time for that, right? So they agree, boom. And so we've seen it. We flesh it out. Some of the deacons are in here. We know it's, it's been a great thing. It's them using, they're just serving. Mm. Now, what about the Great Commission? Have you thought about this? The Great Commission is for every single believer. The Great Commission is for a man, woman, boy, or girl. If you have trusted Christ as your Savior, believed in his work solely for salvation, your Great Commission DNA is Matthew 28. You don't have to go get a degree for that. You don't have to tarry for that. You don't have to really go to a lot of classes for that. At the moment of conversion, so much so, 2 Corinthians 15 would say that it's in the present tense, not future tense, that you have now, you have a ministry of reconciliation and a message of reconciliation. Every single person that's in Christ. So here's what I want to say. The Great Commission then, traditionally, it has been approached or seen as something just for men. Here's why. What about baptizing? Traditionally. So I'm talking about traditionally. If the Great Commission is for every single believer, why have traditionally in the church, we've, a, we've just kind of succumbed to this, this idea that, okay, just it's only for males to baptize. If Mandy leads a lady to Christ, well, she has. And it's like, like if, like she never had. But she, she's, the Lord has used her. Lead a lady to Christ, disciple the lady, and that lady, out of all pureness and, and genuineness, looks at her and go, will you, will you, will you, will you disciple, will you um, baptize me? Well, no, the Great Commission, there's a clause in there, in the Great Commission, it's really kind of hidden in there, uh, it's really for men only. I'm just saying, guys, have, have, put on your thinking caps. The ch change is coming. Crossroads, change is coming. Change is coming. Change is inevitable. Ch change is inevitable. I mean, as we're in this room right now, change, the culture is changing even right now outside. 
Change is always happening. So what we want to do as a church, we want to say this. We want to marry the gospel. We want to marry theological truth. We want to wrestle with the Bible. We want to wrestle with the content. And hopefully, by God's grace, he leads us to a place of sound doctrine, which we know he will. He's faithful to that. We want to marry this, but we want to date the methods. We don't want to date the gospel and marry the methods. Then we're in trouble. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying in here this morning? We got to be very careful. You may say, well, pastor then lost it. He, been, he getting too comfortable. He turning liberal. No, I'm not. I'm just praying and trying to line up with Jesus. That's what I'm trying to do at the end of the day. So ladies, let me just tell you this. You, you have worth, you have value, and we want to celebrate in the proper context God's gifting in your life in this church. The change is coming. Pastor Larry, he, him and Vicky, they flew to uh, North Carolina to meet Mandy and I. And they, they, I mean, we sat across this table, ate some good food, and he just said, man, look, Marcus, change, it's time for change. Pastor Larry, for some of you guys, you don't know, he's a previous pastor, I succeeded. He said, change, it's, it's, I can't do it anymore. I've, I've done, I, I'm, I'm done. I have nothing left. He said, if I continue to lead, the church is gonna die. If I continue to lead, the church is going to, it's starting to plateau. I just, I don't know where to go next. Larry understood that change needed to happen. We're going to make changes while I'm here. But even after I'm gone, there's going to be other changes that's going to happen. Change is inevitable. And here's the deal. We don't want to be so stuck in tradition, so stuck in our own ways, so stuck like the little guy stuck in verse 11, little narcissist. We don't want to be stuck like little narcissists going, no, this is just about me. I, I got, God, I have your whole kingdom figured out. I got your whole sovereign mind figured out. I got all of the Bible interpreted just to a T, all the, everything from just all the theological premises and the tentacles of all the systematic theology. I got everything figured out. And matter of fact, when I study the Bible, I've exhausted the text. No, you have not. The Bible is eternal. The, I'm just scratching the surface right now with this thing. Matter of fact, the word says that everything will pass away, but God's word will remain. So here it is. Change is coming. And we want to align with the Lord. We want to align with the Lord and say, let's, let's move the gospel ball down the field. So that's partnering in Boston, planting churches in Chicago, here locally. Church in Alden Bridge helped plant that one. Hope Church, we helped plant that one. City of Grace in Tyler, the most recent one. Pastor Hector helped plant that one in Tyler, doing well. Man, we want to plant churches. We want to reach the loss. We want to go against the grain of what the culture is saying. And guys, I'm going to tell you, it's a lonely place. It's a lonely place. But I wonder in this room, are you saying, no, nah, Pastor, I want to be cool with tradition because tradition, you can hide behind tradition and be disobedient. You can hide behind tradition and be complacent. There's nothing about the cross that's complacent. There's nothing about Calvary that's complacent. There was nothing about Jesus' ministry that was complacent. So here it is. We, we, we want to marry the gospel. Mm, I'm going to marry this. But I want to date the methods. So here are two things we want to land the plane. A lot of diversity in this group. I, I, again, guys, I could stay there. There was so much in here, the different names, what they mean. But here's what I noticed with this group. 26 names. They had a common conviction. All the diversity, different places that they were from, all the different uh, dynamics, socioeconomic statuses, and I mean, all the different deals that brought about the diversity. What drew them together? What caused them, as Paul would say, to even risk their lives? Well, they had a common conviction, and that common conviction was this, that they, they heard or some of them had even seen the risen Savior. They saw Jesus. He appeared to over 500 plus people at one time. You mean to tell me everybody was hallucinating at the same time? 500 people? No. 
Women at the tomb, he met them. They, they knew lives changed forever. You know, it's funny because we operate in a place of doubt. And Thomas, poor Thomas, he gets beat up all the time as doubting Thomas. But you know, some of Jesus' greatest statements came after some of Thomas's doubting statements in the Bible. Y'all remember the story? Thomas was despondent that Jesus had died, and so he wasn't with the disciples when the first time the disciples had saw Jesus. And so the Bible says that Thomas wasn't with him, and so I wonder, in Bible times, what happened, even in our culture today, animals, they will go out into a distant land to die. They don't want to die around other people. They want to go to a distant land and die. So this is what many theologians will say, that this is what Thomas did. He was so despondent. Have you ever been despondent? I mean, just low, this... Three years walking with King Jesus, he's gone. He wanted to die. So the next time they come running, they find this boy. He like shaggy. He ain't shaved. He looking a hot mess. Hey, Thomas. Hey, yo, we saw Jesus. Man, come on, guys. Stop playing with me. Don't waste my time. Man, we saw Jesus. We, We really saw him. And Thomas goes, okay, okay, okay. If you really saw him, then here's the deal. I will believe if... Let me ask you this question. Do you have an if faith or regardless faith? Some of us, we have an if faith. If God, if I see X, Y, and Z, that's when I really believe. That's when I'll put all my yes on the table. God is not looking for an if faith. He's looking for whatever faith. So what did Jesus do? I know it's Halloween. I don't want to spook nobody out. But Jesus, the Bible says in, in John 20, Jesus came, the disciples were meeting, they were afraid and in there because, you know, they were associated with Jesus, so the culture, you had religious leaders, you know, whatever. So they were kind of afraid. Jesus come walk straight through the door, <laughs> cold with it. The Bible says he just came, he just, <laughs> normally we'll see him knocking, things of that nature, he comes straight through the door. And what does he do? He goes straight to Thomas. I think some of us were doubting the Lord, and even today the Lord is saying, I'm, gonna come, I'm coming straight, this, this morning I'm, I'm coming straight for you. I'm real. Thomas, put your hands in my finger. What do you do? Can you see that? Can can you imagine? Can y'all imagine that? Thomas, I can have other disciples. I can imagine they're like, I hope this fool believe now. You know what I mean? Man, if not, he crazy, right? So here it is. Boom, bang. And then, man, put your hand in my side. I mean, can you imagine your hand going in the side of Jesus where he had been speared? Blood and water fell out. Hey, here's the deal. Don't allow, see, doubt is okay, I believe, for the Christian. Fear is the real issue. Because fear tends to drive out faith. It's amazing that the Bible would have over 366, I I believe, statements on do not fear. I wonder why. Because we need to have faith in the Lord. They had a common conviction. They knew. They knew. They didn't have no campaign, no social media, no budget, no PR group. Uh, this is a common, compelling conviction. They knew Jesus died and he rose again on the third day, and in some form or fashion, it counted for them. When he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders, and before that he uttered, "It is finished." They they were saying it for it, 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 it counted for me somehow. It counted for me. And based on that, I want to live my life completely yielded and useful for the kingdom of God. That was the only conviction. That's the only thing we can actually say. And so here it is. They, they, they just wanted to let somebody know. Here's what R.C. Sproul, I love you, said. He said, evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to, where to find bread. So conviction is this. I don't know how convicted you are about the gospel, what Jesus did on the cross for you, that he is alive. He, he rose on the third day. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and his present ministry is to intercede on your behalf. Right now, he's interceding. Right now, he's interceding for y'all and for me. Jesus. Here's what conviction is. It's a belief held on the basis of evidence. Faith. Your faith is only going to be as strong as what you put it in. I want to put my faith in Jesus, regardless of what it may look like, regardless of the outcome don't come out the way I want it. I want to put my faith on and in in Jesus. Well, man, we got 29 seconds. Man, that's crazy. Mm -mm -mm. 
Here's what Alistair Begg said. He said this, when a man kneels, man, woman, boy, girl, in Christ, it does something to his head and his heart. Our posture, your posture reveals how you respond to Jesus. Just basic kneeling. You know what's amazing about these attributes or these characteristics that Paul lists these people and how we connected them to? I mean, he says, man, that some of them, some of them were servants, some of them fellow workers, some of them worked hard. He, he says that language. Fellow prisoners cared for, served, suffered, risked their necks, risked their lives. They loved well, hospitable. You say, where is that? Well, Rufus's mother, she had to have been hospitable to some degree. Take that boy apple pie. Take him something. He said, man, he said, man, she was, she's been a, she has been a mother to me. Maybe she prayed for him. Maybe she just wrote him a note and said, man, you, you, Paul, you, you're doing a fantastic work. We don't know. But they also had a commitment. I don't have much time with this, but they had a commitment. They were committed to, their commitment came from their conviction. Ben, you guys can come on up. Their commitment was connected to their conviction. They were committed because of their conviction. They were committed because they had seen Jesus. They were committed because they knew that life was bigger than them. And we don't serve the Lord just to have our names in a list. If you want your name to be in lights and be seen all the time, hey, be, be very careful. You're probably not serving the Jesus of the Bible. You're probably a fashion for your own self, a Jesus uh, that agrees with you all the time, that never dis disagrees with your sin. You probably have fashioned in your mind this, this rendition of Jesus. Well, the Bible says they're committed. They were committed. And I, it's funny because Paul, Paul, why would you name these people? Again, just ask questions. In my study, I do this. But Paul, why, why did you take time? And as I'm thinking about that, I was thinking, I said, man, I've never really thought about Paul having friends. Have you? How often have you just thought like Paul was, he had a whole bunch of friends. No, we tend to see Paul as like a renegade for Jesus. Don't y'all? Like a RoboCop, like a RoboCop type dude. Just planting churches. Healing people, doing whatever. We just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the tape, the Terminator. I mean, just like, you know, that's what we just like, I'll be back, right? We just, we just see him like that, just this grit guy. Paul had a tender side. Paul needed people. And the commitment was connected to other people. The commitment was connected to community. The commitment was connected to a conviction. The commitment was com committed to a one who was ultimately committed. I'm glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that Jesus was committed. I'm, I'm so glad that Jesus was committed. Why, Pastor? Why are you so excited? Well, I'm excited for this reason, that he doesn't count my sin against me anymore. He doesn't count your sin against you if you're in Jesus. But Jesus willingly died for you to forgive you of your sins, to expiate. That means to wash clean though you were stained like crimson he said that he would make you white as snow from the penalty of sin everything he's been talking about and this is where their conviction came from this is where their commitment came from it's, it's really chapters 1 through 11 this is it I, I'm not, I, guys I, this is uh, from no more shame, no more guilt, and no, those things creep in, but, but, but I'm committed, I'm committed to God. No matter if I risk my life, no matter if I die, no matter if it, it costs me a little public fame, no matter if it costs me to be uncomfortable a little bit, I'm willing to be committed for the great news of Jesus Christ. I'm committed. So here it is. They're committed to the fact that Jesus not only died, but he rose three days later put in silence to sin, death, and the grave. I told y'all, greet each other with a holy kiss was the easiest part of this text. It really is. And, but, but here's the deal. They also had this commitment on, man, I got, I got to pass this on. I, got to, I have to pass this on. Do you know Romans 16, 1 through 16, we're all beneficiaries. Crossroads exist because of this list. Crossroads literally exists because of that list. You heard the gospel from somebody in some context, ultimately because of God's sovereignty and things of that nature. Yes, we're in his providence. We understand that. But, but it was the faith, the conviction, and the commitment that these people had to pass the thing on. 
that, that's the only reason. I heard the gospel in Fresno, California, 1990. Well, it, that, that Pastor Marvin Davis, it was because the, he was a beneficiary of that list. And then everybody else. It's amazing because Pastor Larry, y'all remember this, April 20, he said, man, look, I'm, I'm, Marcus, here it is. I'm passing the baton to you. He said, will you point, this is all he said. We, we got up, we're done eating. We walked out to like the little area. He said, will you point them to Jesus? That was his only question. Will you point them to Jesus? Now, he had been the pastor, the only pastor at that time, man, for 25 some years. He said, will you point them to Jesus? I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to point them to Jesus. He said, yeah, it's going to be good. You're the guy. Pass it on. He passed it on. That's all this group is doing. They're passing it on. There's a generation coming behind us. Gen Z, they're right on our doorstep. Alpha, right on our doorstep. They're right, they're coming. What are we going to do with the gospel? What are we going to do with, do we have the common conviction and the common commitment like we see in this text? Oh, it's just a random list of people. No, it's not. They literally risk their lives. Here, here. Hey, Wallace, come here, man. Pass it on. I'm not, I'm not going nowhere, guys. Oh, snap, get the camera out. Oh, and stop. And by the way, why do we always record everything? Do you remember back in the days you had that big old cell phone, that big old brick? You couldn't record nothing. You just, you had a mental image. Amen. But Doc, I mean, this is what it's about. I'm nine years older than him. And so at some point, change is going to come. I'm doing this as an analogy. <laughs> Change is going to come. Change is inevitable. I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to pass it on like this list of 26 people. You're going to have to pass it on to somebody. Who, who are you passing it to? The baton of the gospel is in your hand. Will you let tradition hold you back? Or will you submit to the Lordship and the surrender to the Spirit of God and saying, God, what are you doing in our time today? There's theological truth and principles in the old days, but that stuff, some of it and most of it, it crossed the cultural bridge. And Lord, help me to see it because I don't want to be married to tradition. I want to be married to truth. So I don't know yet. I don't know. We're, we're on the right trajectory as a church. We're, we definitely, we're on the right trajectory. If y'all want to feel better, you can hand that back to me. If y'all want to feel better about that, like, man, I'm not, I can't enjoy my lunch now because he gave it to him. Shh, quiet. I don't know where you're at. So here, let's pray. Let's pray this. Lord, 